Hello, and welcome to our next presentation. This is day three, of the final day of the symposium. And on behalf of the MIT CDOIQ virtual symposium, we would like to thank all our sponsors who have sponsored the symposium this year. Please keep a lookout for a very special survey that we'll be sending out shortly. In the meantime, let me thank our sponsors, Deloitte, Informatica, Privacy Analytics, Dalwix, Fusion Alliance, KPMG, Santo Consultants, Tamer, Relation, Ali Data, Big ID, Bumi, Caserta, Citizen, Data Kitchen, Garage, Okira, Pilog, Click, ThoughtSpot, Eckerson, Global ID, Snowflake, and Starburst. Please take a chance to go to the Content Hub, see what content to have, download that, and if you get a chance, reach out to our partners. Without our partners, we would not be able to hold a symposium. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to session 15B on data monetization, data productization from artificial intelligence. I'll read that again. Data monetization from data productization to artificial intelligence. We are delighted to have with us uh, Chintan Shaw, who is Vice President of Data Science and Analytics at Hila. And this is very topical, uh, Chintan, because uh, we just finished up with uh, our CDO 4.0 from Mario uh, from the Garden Research Board, which was talking about that very subject. So very timely. I'm going to pass control over to you and you can take it away. We look forward to your session. Thank you so much, uh, Rob. Let me put my slides in the slide share here. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Rob, um, and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm here joining from Dallas, Texas, and uh, it's a bright sunny morning already. Um, it feels like 100 degrees already here. Uh, we have folks uh, joining from all over the world. So good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Um, you know, thanks for joining here. Um, you know, uh, before we start, I think, uh, uh, you know, thanks to the, uh, to the CDO IQ team. They have done a fabulous job doing this conference virtually here. Um, you know, I was, um, you know, when, when they decided that it's going to be virtual, I was like, gosh, I was, I was really waiting to go to MIT, right? But just looking at the last three days here, they have done a fabulous job. Um, so, so before we start, I would like to thank um, Dr. Wang, Rob, um, and Elizabeth for having me. And, you know, special thanks to, to Derek Strauss. I've, I've known Derek for so many years and have, and have had a pleasure of learning so much from him. So thanks, uh, thanks Derek, and congratulations for the award yesterday. Um, you, you really deserve that. All right, so with further ado, let's get started here, um, you know, with the, uh, with the session today, this morning. Uh, on the agenda, I'm going to introduce you to who I am and what Hyla Mobile is, uh, hopefully in the quick first five minutes or so, five to 10 minutes. Uh, then we'll go jump right into data monetization. Uh, I have two examples of what Hyla Mobile has done um, in the last five, six years, four or five years probably. And then we'll just leave some time that, you know, towards the end for any questions and, and such. Um, so with, with, with about me here, um, you know, I've, I, in data analytics is all that I've done, all, all my career, right? Last 17, 18 years, data and analytics, machine learning, AI is all that I have done and that's all I understand. Um, I have been with Hyla for over seven years now, um, had, the, had the pleasure of joining the, the, the team and the, when the company was really new, there was no data warehouse, there was no data strategy and had, had the pleasure of, of you know, building it from scratch, right? Not most of uh, you would have gotten that type of a chance and I was just lucky to have had that. Uh, to start something from scratch, right? Building the, you know, writing the first line of code and having the journey where we started off with data, BI reporting, and now we are into machine learning and AI. Uh, as I told you before, I'm, I'm based out of Dallas, Texas, and, uh, um, and you know, before joining Hyla, I was, uh, you know, I was with, uh, with Verizon for almost 10 years. All right, so let's bring us to Hyla. What is Hyla? What do we do? Um, as I said, there is a, you might, you might have not heard of Hyla before. Um, and so I'll probably spend a couple of minutes here just introducing Hyla. Uh, if you live in US, there is a strong chance that you 
you have utilized one of Hylas technologies in the past, just not know about that, um, right? So if you have purchased a new phone uh, in the last, you know, seven, eight years or so, and while while purchasing that phone, if you were asked or if you uh, or, or if you decided to trade in your old phone, there is a strong likelihood that you touched upon Hyla systems somewhere during the transaction. Uh, Hyla is the company that started off this concept of device trading, mobile device trading, back in 2009. Right. So if you think of, or if you rewind, um, you know, 10, 11 years back. Um, when when we would buy a phone, what do we do with, with the old phone? What do we used to do? I would just put it in the drawer, right? Uh, and I'm pretty sure there are lots of folks out there who, who, who are doing the exact same thing because we never thought that there was any value left in the phone. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's starting in 2009, 2010 when, when, when we launched our first program uh, with, a, with a tier one carrier uh, talking about device trading is, was, was, was even started. Um, and when you look at where we are today, just look at your carrier's website, look at your OEM, whoever you are, you know, your phone is, but look at their website. And it's hard to find an offer where there is no trading attached, right? If you have to buy a new phone, if you need that shiny new promotion that says buy one, get one, or, you know, 400 bucks off, more than likely they'll ask you to trade in your old phone because it helps Companies offset their marketing costs. It helps us as con you know as as consumers because uh, we don't want to pay a thousand fourteen hundred dollars. Uh, we we obviously want to have some discounts there. So it helps everyone, right? Uh, in the last what seven eight years, we have put six billion dollars back in consumers' pockets, right? So when you go and trade in your old phone and the the carrier decides to pay you two hundred dollars. When you add up all those money, it's been six billion dollars so far, right? Over sixty million phones. So just think of the size of, um, you know, of this program. Uh, when you think of our, you know, uh, of our of our customers, as I said before, anyone who is in the mobile device, um, you know, ecosystem, be it an OEM, be it a, a wireless carrier, we have some connections with them, right? Um, depending on who they are, depending on what programs we serve. Uh, they, they might be using all of Hylas technologies or some of Hylas technologies. Our, our, you know, our, our, our technologies are, are very, very modular. So depending on the consumer, they are using some sort of Hylas technologies uh, and, and, and continue to do that. All right, now that the, now that the introductions are out, um, hopefully you know enough about me, hopefully you know enough about Hyla. And again, my goal with, with just explaining about Hyla is to, to make sure that you appreciate the two um, to examples that I have today uh, for data monetization, because once you understand the industry, what we do, I think it will make a lot more sense on, on the products that we have built. Uh, and, 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 you know, hopefully you'll be able to appreciate that better. All right, so now that introductions are out, let's talk about something more fun, right? Money is fun, right? Who doesn't like money? Um, so let's talk about money. Let's, let's talk about data monetization, right? This is... Uh, <clears throat> This is the subject of the day here. But even before we get into data monetization, let's talk about what data monetization is not, right? We'll have enough time to talk about what it is, but let's spend some time talking about what it is not. I'll let you guys read through this. I'm gonna give you a few seconds here, just, just read through this. Um, if you're reading this, you know that data monetization has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. Um, this, is a, this, is a, this is a good card that I found. If you are here for, for cryptocurrencies, guys, sorry, this is not the right question. So now we know what it is not. Let's just focus on what data monetization actually is. What does it do? Um, so I found this, this really cool picture that summarizes data monetization very, very, very well. It is something where you take all of your data feed it through what's shown here as a funnel, right? And that funnel could be a process. It could be something that you have designed that's specific and unique to your company. Um, it's, you know, depending on your strategy, depending on who you are, which, which industry you are in, that funnel could mean different things. But the goal eventually is you take all of your data, feed it into something 
and the result of that is money, right? That's a plain, simple way of thinking about data monetization. How do you take all of your data in a way that it results in you know, money for the company? Uh, we'll look at some examples. So we'll look at how other companies are doing it. Uh, you know, what's, how do you go about doing it? But the concept is very, very simple, right? Very simple. Um, so here we'll get into a little bit more, more details of what, what data monetization is. Uh, when we talk about money, it is, it could be reducing costs, it could be increasing revenues, it could be improving sales, et cetera. But at the end of the day, Data monetization is when you start leveraging your data assets in a way that it improves your company's top or bottom line, or hopefully both, right? Um, it is as simple as that. There, is, there are two ways of doing it, or there are two most common ways companies have done it or they are doing it. There's indirect way, and then there is a direct way. Indirect way is a company, you, a company A using its own data to improve something within the company. It could be reducing the cost, right? So um, you have a warehouse where there are, you know, so many different processes, there are so many, uh, so much of different materials used. How can data help you with reducing the waste, improving the productivity, uh, you know, improving efficiency of your machines, et cetera, et cetera. That's a good example of, of data monetization because you are taking your data and you're reducing the cost, which still means more money at the end of the day. Um, the second good example would be what you see always in marketing, right? You'll see, hey, you just purchased product A and we sell you product B and C as well. And 87% of the folks who bought A also bought B and C, those type of things. Those are all cross-sell, upsell opportunities that the companies where they use data. Um, again, you know, this is a this is a good example where the result of it is 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 an increase in revenue. It's increasing your top line. There are lots of other ways where you just optimize your programs, your marketing spends, how you're spending your, uh, you know, your dollars on sales, your you know how you're spending money on marketing, etc. Based on looking at the data, analyzing the data, and making sure you are using data as an asset in the company. Uh, there, there are other ways of doing it, which is really direct monetization. Right? And direct monetization is where we will be spending more money, uh, more time to that. Um, direct monetization is where you take your data and directly sell it to someone and generate revenue from it. So the most common way of doing this is to sell data. You, 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 you have data that you think someone else would love to get. And that's where you would you would come up with direct monetization, where you take all of your data assets, put it into um, you know some sort of a data or analytics platform. And we'll we, we have a few examples where we kind of look at those. But you know, think of that funnel that we, we were looking at before. You take the data, put it into a funnel in a way that someone would really like to see that 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 information, which would result in data monetization. The most common way, as I said before, is data as a product. You have seen lots of companies selling data. Uh, you can buy data from them. Um, and that's a, that's a great example of data as the product uh, an example. Analytics as a product is, is you know, a, uh, the same way, uh, where you take data, come up with a lot of insights, insights that would help the company drive their sales, marketing, et cetera. And they, you know, they, would, they would pay you for that. Um, one of the, the, the other ways here is also data as a platform or data platform. And this is kind of very, very unique. Uh, data platform is where you, know, you, you are bringing your own data, but there's already so much of other data available on the platform for you to cross reference, join, combine, and come up with insights that you might not be able to see just by using your own information. So data as a platform is, is you know, another way where data monetization would be, would be very, very useful. And then the last way, which is still kind of new, is where you use just the data and come up with something, build a product uh, that's where you are using the data, but you are not providing the data directly to the consumer, but that data um, that's used by that app or by that product is going to uh, get you revenue. So we have a couple of examples here that how, how, how and what Hyla has done. And they are both good examples of direct 
uh, monetization. Uh, one one of them is a data analytics as a product, and then the second one is is a is a new product built on data as the as the foundation. So let's jump into uh, those two examples here, um, in our, here in our in our in a bit. So when when you think of data monetization, I think the obvious question was, okay, it sounds good. Uh, it sounds like we can you know you can really generate some revenue and stuff. But how much money are we talking about? Right? Is it is it a a few pennies here, or, or are we talking about something really, really significant amount of uh, money? And when I had that question, um, you know, who better to check on a research than MIT itself, right? So I kind of looked at MIT and they have done a, a fabulous research here uh, a couple of years back and they had published an article here uh, earlier this year uh, after the pandemic started, uh, which kind of talks about, you know, more than ever, this, there is a need right now um, because Companies have struggled a bit, and when when the companies start to struggle, that's when you kind of think of what are the other ways we could be helping the, the corporate. Uh, can can data be really used right now more than at any other time? Uh, and and we saw over the past couple of days here, even attending the conferences, we saw so many examples of what companies are doing uh, during the pandemic from how they have used that to track COVID and, you know, COVID's uh, cases everywhere in the world to a lot of other business cases that we saw the last couple of years. So more and more as we are going through the crisis, there is more need of data monetization. Just taking a step back and looking at your assets, figuring out we can use it for sure. How can we use it better? And is there a way someone else would like to pay us uh, for for you know looking at this data and or, or you know for for having access to this information. So when I looked at this MIT's research, they have divided how data is monetized into similar but a little different way than what we saw in the previous slide, where they, they said okay, optimal uh, you know um, uh, optimization is 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 everything about reducing costs, and then there's consumer focus, which is really about driving sales, um, right? And then there is data business, which is where, which is what we were looking at before as direct monetization. Um, and then the last is future ready, where you know you, the company is doing everything. They are doing everything internally. They are trying to sell everything externally. They are much ahead of their, uh, you know, of the competition and etc. But because of how mature their data uh, data programs internally are, because they are able to do a lot more with their data. And when you look at this, look at the, the role there in the table that talks about how much companies are generating revenues between 2% to all the way up to 55% of their revenues. Right? That's how big data monetization could be. That's how powerful it could be. It, it, it could be really driving a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of revenue for you. All right, so now we'll spend the next few minutes here talking about a couple of examples of what, what Hyla has done. And we have, um, you know, we have two different unique products um, where data monetization was, was applied to. How did we do that? What are the products? What did we do? How did we do that? And what did we learn from, from those? The first one here is Hyla Device ID. Um, and device IQ is um, is really providing pricing analytics. So it's a software as a service platform that we um, that we have built data for uh, for customers. And as we looked at before, our customers really are uh, the wireless carriers, OEMs, retailers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and how can they use analytics more and more with respect to pricing, with respect to supply and demand? Uh, um, you know, kind of figuring out how much you know, demand is out there in the secondary market of these phones and et cetera. We have, we have developed with three different sort of modules within the highlight device IQ. There is a buy side index, which is how much money should you pay um, to buy that phone back from a consumer. So when you walk into a, to a retailer store or to a, uh, to, uh, to a, a, a tier one wireless carrier store, and you show that okay, you have an iPhone, iPhone 8, for example, they have a, you know, they have price and they'll tell you that that phone is worth, you know, X number of dollars. So that, and that, that pricing and the uh, analysis behind that or how, how much that value is, that's, 
that's that's really buy side index. So how much can you pay to buy that own is our buy side index. The other side of the spectrum is sell side index. Once you have that own, um, you know, where do you want to sell it? How much can you get selling it into different places, right? So all that stuff is part of sell side index. And then the, the thing in, in uh, you know, on the right there is the risk management where you combine the buy side and sell side and figuring out what type of risks are you taking? Um, you know, one of the good examples is all of these upgrade programs. When those devices are returned back to the carrier, are they risky? Are they going to be profitable? Uh, things of that nature. So that's very, very high level of what the program is. And, um, and you know, I don't want to take too much time here. I just want to make sure you understand what, you know, what the, the product is. So, um, so as we go into how, you know, how and what we did, it's going to probably resonate better. From how it's used today by our, you know, by our customers, similar things to what I just talked about before. Uh, they want to make sure that their prices are competitive. Um, you don't want to be left left behind the competition because the prices were too low. Um, also, making sure that you are taking the right decision on what the disposition of every phone is. Um, does it make sense for you to spend a few extra bucks to repair and refurb and etc. Or does it just make sense for you to just sell it in a, in, a, in, a, in a wholesale market? So there are lots of insights that we could provide to our consumers, uh, uh, to our customers, I should say, using the platform. Um, so that's pretty much about what I wanted to explain you about device IQ with respect to what it is. With respect to data, we collect data. Uh, we, we are ourselves selling millions of phones every year, buying millions of phones every year. But then also collecting data from the outside world. Um, we collect data from... I believe 50 to 60 different countries right now. Um, uh, you know, when you look at the, uh, <clears throat> the the GIV pricing, and then there are 17 plus countries where we sell our own phones. So we 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 collect all this data from different places. You know, put it into our statistical model and figure out what's the right course of act, you know what is the right course of action uh, for every device. Um, I was when I was talking to a couple of folks here at MIT. Um, their feedback was, we would love to know your journey, right? Not just where you are today, but how did you start? If, you know, device IQ wasn't built in a day, um, but how did you start and how long did it take you and how, how was your journey here um, or, you know, in the last five years or so? So I thought, okay, let's just, let's just take a step back and look at the journey. And as I said, I was, you know, I've been with the company for seven years, right? So for the first one or two years, we just did very, very basic stuff, building a plain, simple data warehouse, making sure that there is enough clean reports out there that the business can trust. And that itself was a pretty big challenge. And it took us a year or two to just complete that, that portion. Once we thought that our data was mature enough, once we realized that our, um, our BI and reporting is kind of trusted, that's where we jumped into, okay, now we have a pretty good mature platform. We have a pretty good mature way of doing things. Can we now jump into more, more advanced uh, analytics? And that's where we started into saying, okay, let's, let's look at what else could we do. And can we do it internally first? And we started off with, with our internal processes. Let's try and do some statistical modeling so we can figure out when the prices, is, prices will be high, when the prices are gonna low, what impacts to, uh, to, a, to an older generation uh, phone when a new generation phone comes out, uh, when an iPhone 12 will come out hopefully later this year, what will happen to iPhone 10 and iPhone, iPhone 11 pricing? So we started off with doing some predictive modeling, statistical modeling, started to use it internally for our business first. And when, when we reached a stage where we thought it was really mature now, that's where we jumped into can we sell this to others? Would, would others be interested in buying something like this? And that's where we were in 2017 when we, when, when we really started deep into device IQ um, and trying to, to you know, make sure that we, we, we can come up with a good business case. You know, we can make sure that um, you know, others who we are selling this would also uh, see the value of this information. And that's where it started our journey in, late 2016, early 2017. But we, we, we obviously started first um, doing this internally. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, as I said, it's been a journey. As of right now, where we are, we are focused a lot on machine learning and AI from 
what we will be looking at a couple of examples today, but also um, some of the things that we are doing in our, you know, in our warehouse as these phones are going through and we collect millions of phones. How do we use some you know, vision technologies out there so that we don't have to have someone looking at each and every phone, figuring out uh, if it has you know, scratches and cracks and this and that. Uh, so using a lot of these AI and vision-based technologies uh, in, in the last couple of years. So what type of um, you know, approach and considerations you would take when you think of productizing data? Obviously, it starts with, with, you know, with the strategy, right? You have to ensure that building a product is within company strategy. You have to get approvals all the way from the top and make sure everyone is into it. You would need um, building a data product or, or, or you know, any product for that matter isn't going to be done overnight, isn't going to, I mean, it's going to take a lot of resources. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of money as well. And you have to make sure that there is budget for that, but also make sure that there is, there is enough sign off from everyone to have other teams join in a, in a combined effort. So it has to align with your company strategy. It cannot be just decided by the data team. And let's just go and build a product. It has to be approved all the way from the top. Once you have those approvals, once you know that that's what you want to do, the next question really is about, you know, what type of data do you have? What's the type of information you have that someone else would, would love, love to get? Um, once you know that, then you look at opportunities. Like using this data, what type of things could you produce? What are the different opportunities out there in the market? And, and, and you know, I always say this, but this is, a, this is an ongoing thought process. And you can't just come up with one, um, you know, one meeting where you, where, you, you know, where you get everyone together, think of how do we monetize data, and then you don't meet, a, you don't meet again for a year. It's, it's something that, sh that you should be thinking all the time. And look, this is, this is a cool stuff. How about we add this to the product? Um, you know, when you do something good for your own business, you have to think, can I apply the same principle to my data products as well? And it's a continuous mindset. It's a continuous thing that, um, that you have to enhance your products based on what you're seeing. And, and you know, sometimes you are hearing from your consumers or your, or your, or your customers, depending on who you are selling it to. Once you know that, the next question really is about offering. Um, what exactly are you offering? Are you going to be selling the data or are you going to be selling insights uh, or, or you know, analytics around that? Selling data would be a little easier, um, but if it's, if it's insights and analytics, then there is an, an additional layer of work that needs to be done. And you have to figure out where, where exactly your you know, customers would be and what would you uh, want to sell them. But all of, you know, none of this stuff would be uh, would be possible if you do not have a good solid data foundation. You have to ensure that the data that you have is really mature. It has gone through multiple layers of checks. There is a good data governance around it, making sure that um, the, the, the data, most importantly than not, is trusted. You do not want to spend hours and hours uh, explaining them why your data is, is, is you know, good. It should be trusted data and you should have good mature processes that would show that it could be trusted. Uh, and then it comes down to the team. As I said that, you know, before uh, building products would be expensive. Um, and, you know, data analytics is, is, a, uh, is a field that's no different there. You have to ensure you have the right team. You have to ensure um, that, that the teams understand business. Because when you are talking about data business, uh, we as data uh, you know, experts have to be very, very close to business. We have to think like business. Um, once you know your, your, your team is set, uh, once you know that you have your core team that, that you could trust with building, uh, you know, building a data product, also look at what softwares do you use. You might be using some software for internal purpose, but you might not feel that that's the right software for exposing your data and analytics for the external world. Uh, sometimes there might be also some licensing limitations, right? Something that you use internally might, might not be used externally from your licensing agreement standpoint. So look at, you know, those, those aspects, the things that, that work internally um, with respect to software may or may not work, uh, you know, work externally all the time. So you have to also keep an eye on that. Um, data security, um, very, very, very important. 
to make sure that the, the data is, is accessed in a secure way by your, uh, by your customers. And if it's the data as a platform type of an offering, then you have to also make sure that uh, your, your customers are able to trust that when they bring in their data, their data would not be seen by somebody else. Right? Think of a wall garden, make sure that there is a wall garden there where they can do everything that they need to do within that, uh, you know, within those walls and no one else will have access to their data. Very, very, very important, especially if you have a data as a platform type of, uh, type of an offering. Um, there are legal aspects and this is extremely important. Um, you know, making sure that you know what you want um, your customers. So when your customers get data from you, do you wanna put any restrictions there? Do you wanna make sure that you know what they can do? Um, who owns the data once they get it from, from your platform or from your you know, a portal, you know, wherever you have your information on? Who owns that data? Does it, um, you know, do you retain the, uh, the rights to that information or are you selling the rights? Make sure that there is a good legal review. Uh, you also have to, to make sure that there is like good data agreements out there. You have to make sure that there is a good licensing agreement on what they can and what they cannot do with, the, you know, with that information and insights. Once you have all that stuff ready, now you are down to the normal product level, um, you know, uh, considerations. Things like how do you sell it? Um, do you have your pricing plans ready? And based on our experience, when you are in the B2B space, uh, you have to have some sort of a bundle. Uh, we have consumers or, or we have customers that um, buy products from us, but they, they always ask for bundles. Hey, can I get product A, B, and D together, rather than just getting A here. And when, when it's a bundle, there's discounts and stuff like that. So, um, you know, you have to make sure that you know how you're gonna be selling this. Is it gonna be always a standalone or would you like to combine this with some other offering of yours? And after that, the normal product development lifecycle, make sure you know when to update. Um, there is a, there is a, there needs to be a good maintenance cycle and versioning and you know, all that normal stuff. Um, and um, the, the last thing I would say here before, um, before we jump into the next section is, you know, once you have built a data product, managing it and maintaining it is, is a project by itself. It cannot be that you are focused so much on, on building it that you haven't really thought of how you would be maintaining it, how you would be, um, you know, managing uh, you know, revisions to it, managing versioning to it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are lots of things that go into building a data product. Um, we, I had 20 minutes here for, for just talking about data productization. I think we are at 20 minutes right now, but there's just so much of details that goes into data productization. How, how do you build the data product? And with that here, I'm done with one of the two, um, you know, uh, examples that I had. Let me look at the chat window here and see if there are any questions. Uh, else, we'll, we can probably jump into the next section. Hey, uh, Chintan, there are a few questions here, but also just remind people uh, to use the Q&A on Slido to enter their chats, and we will get them into your Zoom window. So there are a few questions uh, that you can go ahead and answer. Sure. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the questions here, guys. Um, the, the first question I see is what are the most critical challenges in the uh, in the journey to uh, data monetization. So based on our experience, um, you know, I kind of went through a few of those, those challenges already, but when we started off five years back, um, and, I, and it's still, uh, you know, some of that is, is kind of still existing today, but getting this, this area here, the legal aspects of data is still not easy. And I think that was probably the most difficult aspect for us at least. When we started off five years back, uh, the data ownership, um, you know, when do you expect the consumers or, you know, customers to delete their data? How much retention do you want to give? Coming up with those policies and how much you feel comfortable with finding good lawyers around, you know, data agreements and stuff it was, was a challenge. And I know things have gotten a lot better in the last five years or so, but still, it's, it's still a challenge. And for me personally, that was the most important challenge. And we spent a lot of time going through all the legal aspects, uh, making sure that we, we are, you know, we are covered legally, um, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, when we're in the data business. Um, the second question, uh, 
The second question here is, let me read out. Isn't it risky to have PNL around data analytics because the profit depends on stakeholders taking actions from the results of analytics? That is so true. That is so true. Um, and that's where you should be able to articulate how this product would be used. You should be in a position to articulate when you sell this information out, especially externally, uh, you should be in a position to show them the ROI. You should be in a, it's, it's a, it's a job that you will have to do. Uh, not your customers. You should be in a position to explain to your customers how this is a good thing for them and, and even help them build a, uh, build a business case around that. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's a, absolutely right. It is, uh, you have to make sure that your customers agree and they understand um, that how it's gonna help them. Uh, the next question here is, what should be the ROI of data platform investment when it comes to monetization? Should be easy to show value from the money saved on, but how many years? Um, great question, really great question. Um, I had that slide here that I kind of had a couple of minutes back. Uh, let me go back to that. Yeah, I would refer you to you know back to uh, to this this analysis uh, from MIT, which kind of shows about what type of ROIs uh, companies are getting. And look at this row here, right? Company revenues from data anywhere between 2% to like over 50%. So if that's how much revenue a company can get from data monetization, that's huge, really huge, right? Uh, it all depends on how much money is spent, but with timing standpoint, it, it, it depends. Um, from the time that we, we say we would start, uh, you know, we would get into data monetization, it took us a good year and a half, two years before we started to sell our first product. That's, it's a, it's a process, not just building, but coming up with sales strategies and, and no customer is gonna buy the product on day one. It takes, there is a sales cycle, especially on, you know, for us because we're in B2B space and our space is a limited number of uh, customers. There are only so many retailers and so many OEMs and so many wireless carriers in the world. So for us, it was a limited uh, cust you know, uh, uh, customer set. So depending on who you are and you know, which you, I would probably say anywhere between one to five years, um, that would be, a, would be my guess. Let's see, are there any more questions? Nope, I think um, uh, that's all I have. Rob, I'm gonna get started here on the, on the second one. Thanks, Chintan. All right. The next example here um, is something that I think you guys would appreciate a lot. Um, this is around device protection. Um, and typically when I talk about this, well, you know, I, I, I would ask the audience and stuff on, on how many folks bought a phone, right? How many folks buy uh, device protection for it? And for, for someone who hasn't seen this space before, a quick overview, device protection is something when you spend $15 a month, $20 a month, um, you know, when, when you sign up for a plan, when, you know, along with the purchase of your phone and say, I'm going to pay 20 bucks a phone, but I need that peace of mind that if, if at all anything goes wrong with my phone, if it's lost and stolen, if there is any damage on it, et cetera, et cetera, then I can get a brand new phone with some sort of a, uh, you know, a copay or et cetera for like $100, $150 uh, off, but you will get a brand new phone from, uh, you know, from your, uh, from your retailer or from your OEM, wherever you, you, know, you purchased your phone from. So the high level device protection is something that when you buy a phone, everyone will ask you, hey, do you wanna cover your phone with any accidental damage? You know, Apple has Apple Care, for example, that a lot of you guys are, might be familiar with. Uh, similarly, all the wireless carriers carry their own insurance plans or device protection plans, uh, et cetera. But, um, but the key here is that you have to pay a monthly fees, which is kind of standard, and then when something goes wrong, you have to pay a one-time fee to get access to a, uh, to a refurbished phone. It's typically never a new device. It's always a refurbished phone. Okay. So, uh, so when we started off this device protection business a couple of years back, we, we, we did a lot of market uh, you know, research on this. Um, and we were kind of very, very surprised with some of the numbers. Uh, our survey showed that four out of 10 millennials interact with their phones more than any other human being in their life. 
just take a step back and think about that. That if phone were a human being, that, that would be the, their favorite person in the world, right? Um, that's how important the phone is nowadays for, for all of us. We are, you know, through, through the pandemic here in the last four or five months, we have realized it even more. You are always on a Zoom, you're always talking to someone on the phone. Um, you know, phone is something that is kind of, you know, very, very tough to imagine even a day without having your phone with you. Um, so on one hand, you have 40% people who think, or 40% of the millennials who, are, who cannot, uh, you know, who, who think that that's the most critical thing in their life more than any other you know, human. Um, and then you think that how expensive the phones are, you know, a brand new iPhone 11 uh, with like 256 gigs and the highest configuration could be as expensive as 49. And then we look at some of the newer phones that have come out with like fold and stuff, that goes to $2,000. We have people who cannot live without their phones. The phones are getting very, very expensive, um, right? And so you would think that your phone is always insured. You always need access to your phone. And so when we, we did our research on this, what we found out was that typically only 40% of the phones are covered by some sort of a device protection plan, right? just 40%. Phone is that expensive, it's that important to everyone. Still, the still there's only 40% folks who are buying some sort of a device protection plan. So the first question was, why not? Right? Why why are folks not buying it? What's going through their minds? Let's try and read that. Let's try and understand what's going on. So as we did the survey, um, what we found out is there are a few reasons here. One, they thought that the premium was very, very expensive, which I kind of kind of understand. You know, some of the, the, the latest ones out there are like $20 plus per month. So that's pretty expensive. Uh, second is that there is not the exact coverage. A um, lot of the coverage that you see in the industry today is sort of like, you know, buy everything together. It's like all in. Um, you know, there is, there is no one that would tell you that, okay, you know what, I'm more susceptible to uh, you know, water damage because I have a habit of leaving my phone in my shorts when I go for a swim. I only need something for water damage, uh, not everything else. Or I only need something for lost and stolen because I, you know, because that's where I think, uh, you know, I, I have a habit of leaving my phone somewhere. It's typically all in right now. There is, and, and you know, that's what drives the cost because it's an all in coverage. Um, the third most important reason is when you purchase your phone, there's already a pretty large, um, you know, large expense that you are making and you might not be in the best shape at that, you know, on that day to spend additional money um, on your coverage. And so you might think, nah, I'm gonna skip it today. But then you go home, you, you, you know, after a few days, you realize that maybe it was not a good decision, but most of the plans today are sold only at the time of purchase, not sort of the, you know, uh, sort of the aftermarket, uh, you know, modes. Uh, and then, you know, roughly 10% of uh, folks in the U.S. buy their phone pre-owned. And that number, according to a lot of research, is scheduled to go up higher and higher. There is no one out there that would cover a pre-owned device. It has to be a brand new phone. And so when we look at those type of reasons, that kind of opened up our mind. I'm like, okay, that, that makes sense. And so what could we do with all of our data assets, with, with you know, all of our you know, other expertise in this space, and come up with something that, that addresses all of these, these different, you know, different problems. And to summarize the, um, you know, the challenges here, I kind of went through it, but the biggest one really is, um, you know, imagine you have a phone and you realize it three months down the road that I would like to have it insured just in case if I do something wrong with it. Um, if you are a wireless carrier or, or if you are an OEM, you can't just take someone's call and you know when someone says, I you know I need insurance today, because at that point in time, you are not sure if that device already has something wrong with it, right? You want to buy the insurance or you want to actually should sell an insurance, not necessarily buy a claim. Um, and so the biggest issue that we realized is folks cannot do this today because there is no way for remotely diagnosing uh, um, you know the uh, the, the device, you have to bring in physically to the store for someone to look at it, make sure you do different tests on it, 
make sure it's in a good condition before you, you know, before you are eligible to buy that. And so that's where we kind of step back and thought, okay, how can we, and you know, how can we, we make this uh, happen? How can we let our buyers buy a phone uh, and then, uh, and then, you know, uh, buy some insurance sometime later? It doesn't have to be on the same day, um, and make sure that we are not, uh, you know, the phone is in good condition at that point in time and all that stuff. So there are lots of ways where folks. Um, uh, have you know all of these diagnoses that you can run you know when you can plug in uh, something when you can download an app and it will tell you if everything is working or not within the phone. But the biggest challenge that we face is the screen cracks, is looking at the physical condition of the phone. Um, there might already be so many scratches on it, so many um, you know so many uh, times there is like the screen that's broken, and those are the type of things that you cannot just have any sort of app download or, or you know on your phone and it will. Kind of, you know, figure that out. And that's where we kind of look back and say, this is the sweet spot, this is where we want to be, and this is the problem that we want to, you know, really solve for. And that's where this, this whole idea of, you know, Lori was born, right? Uh, let's, let's come up with a device protection plan which addresses these problems. We want to make sure that the, that the coverage could be customizable. It doesn't have to be all in. We, we should be in a position that the folks can, you know, remotely diagnose their phone, um, and, and you know, they can figure out if they're eligible or, or you know, ineligible for that. And then the repair and stuff, so that you know, you don't have to ship your device out, wait for two days for a new phone to come, and things like that. It should be, you know, on the fly, quick repair if you have something uh, wrong with the device protection. All right. So as I mentioned before, the key here is remotely, um, you know, assessing the device condition. And that's where all the AI and data comes into play. Um, so I wanted to just kind of uh, kind of spend a couple of minutes here, just walking through what the problem was. And now, now that we know that, let's let's focus on how the solution is, where data is used, where AI is you know is is used, uh, and it's it's all protected by the patents here. We have uh, you know multiple patents on this technology, but essentially, you know, you ask the the, the consumer to download an app. And then do all of these other tests. You know, is my speaker working? It's going to play something similar to what Zoom does and stuff. But then the key here is is the screen here towards the bottom of my you know, of my screen, where let's figure out what type of um, physical condition your phone is in. Does it have cracks? The, you know, does your screen look intact? And screen is by far the number one uh, issue that that uh, you know we have seen in the industry. And for that. How about you take a phone, you know, take your phone and do something with it so that we know if your phone is in a good condition or not. And, and that's what these two steps are. And that's where all the, uh, you know, all the neural networks, all the uh, artificial intelligence comes into play. Um, so the goal here is you take your phone and you know, put it in front of a mirror and it takes a, you know, takes a few pictures. And the, the, you know, the app is, um, you know, app is made in a way that it will guide you uh, how to take pictures, if the focus is correct, et cetera, et cetera. And then it will take a series of pictures. And once it, you know, once it has done that, it kind of looks it up against a neural network that we have built on our own. And, and it will tell you if there is any crack uh, available or not, right? So that's the high level overview of what the solution does. Uh, I have a couple of you know, pictures here that you can see if, you know, if there is cracks here, it's gonna show everywhere that you know, here are the cracks. Um, there is a lot of things here that goes on top of it. Right? How do we ensure that someone's not taking a picture from one phone and then ensuring the second phone? Each and every picture is uh, has a QR code embedded into it, and the QR code is um, is based on the individual IMEI number of the phone, so it cannot be replicated. So there is a lot of ways that we we, we make sure that there is no fraud in this whole system. Um, Collection of pictures, I'll go through the journey here in a couple of minutes, but the collection of pictures is a big thing, right? You have to make sure that when you run such a big neural network on, uh, you know, doing like image recognition, uh, there has to be a good size of pictures available. There should be a good size of pictures that have cracks. There is a good size of pictures that do not have cracks so the neural network can understand what's good and what's bad. And that took us back to the journey, a similar journey to what I had described before. How did we get here? How did we build the app? When did we start? What are the major aha moments that we had here through, um, you know, through this journey? 
Uh, and so we started, you know, our stage one was uh, two plus years back now, um, uh, two and a half years back. And you know, if you remember, TensorFlow uh, was released by Google. It was, um, you know, it was, you know, uh, we were one of the very, very first users of that. So we kind of figured out how to use TensorFlow, how to make it work for that. And since then, it has been a journey. So our stage one was actually just simple white screen, right? It's just basic, simple. We thought, okay, it, this cannot be that difficult. Let's just throw in a few pictures, write a neural network and see how it goes. And it, it was pretty good. It was pretty good for a first uh, stage application. Um, but quickly we realized that it's hard to differentiate uh, when you are using the phone, if there is no background, it's hard to differentiate if there is like a foreign object, like, like, like let's say an example of a, you know, of a hair versus a real crack. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not possible. And so as the team was researching, they found that there is a reason that Star Wars has this you know, green screen always. And we, you know, when we look into movie production and stuff, there's always green screen that you talk about. And so when we research more, we thought like, okay, this is the right thing for us. We wanna make sure that the background turns green before it takes a picture so that there is no other, you know, uh, sometimes there could be someone holding, um, you know, holding a phone and you could see someone's uh, thumb or a finger uh, and, you know, things like that. So, so our next stage was let's jump into, you know, some sort of a green screen where you can see the things a lot more clearer than before. And then we did that, it took us from that stage one to stage two. And we thought, okay, now we are at a really high, uh, you know, accuracy rate. So we were running in 90s, high 90s, uh, you know, accuracy rates. And we thought we have solved this, right? We thought we were done with it. This is a good, um, you know, good way. Our patterns were fine. You know, things looked really, really, really good. Um, and then that's when we started to, you know, test this on the real world. So we gave some phones out, we were doing some tests and gosh, the, the results dropped. We were at like 99% accuracy. And then we start uh, some more real world testing and the results went below 80%. And that, that was our real big aha moment that how can the results be so different between what we had before and just 80% now or less than 80%. And then what we realized as, as our data science team figured out was that the lighting conditions, the shadow, et cetera, is very, very different when you took those pictures in a real world versus all the pictures that were taken uh, in, a, in a lab environment. Um, when it's in a, you know, when it's in a uh, warehouse environment, the pictures always had the same type of lighting, it had the same type of shadow, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas when you go into a real world, people were taking pictures in their bathrooms where there was not enough light or sometimes completely outdoors where there's sun, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So sh in a shadow glare, et cetera, made it so difficult. And there were lots of false positives. There are lots of false negatives and et cetera. And so that was the first real big aha moment for us. And, and we realized that we have a lot more work to do than all the dancing that we we're doing before thinking, okay, we already have a product ready. And so that brought us to stage four and we solved for that problem. We went back and we asked all of our employees and anyone who could help with taking pictures in lots of different light conditions and we collected 400,000 pictures in, 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 in you know, different lighting, uh, different shower conditions, different glare, et cetera, et cetera. And then we thought, okay, now we are going somewhere. Now it's all good. And that's when we hit with our, our second major aha moment, which was related to, um, you know, how good your cameras are. So when you use your cell phone camera, they are much higher resolution nowadays compared to if you're going to use the same thing using a browser on your on your computers, uh, or even if it's not on your computer, even if you're using a browser uh, on your phone itself, the browser actually controls limits how many megapixels are available on the phone uh, for taking a picture. And the picture conditions were so different between like a native app versus a browser-based. And that was our second major aha moment. Uh, we have not taken enough pictures based on browsers. We have been just so much focused on the, on the app so far. And once we solve for that, here we are today, we are still not perfect. We are at 97% accuracy right now. And I have a couple of slides here that shows what are the next things that we would be doing. 
but as we think about how our journey has, there has been lots of ups and downs. We were at 99 and a half percent like two years back and now, now we are much lower at 97, but it has been a journey. We have fixed a lot of things on our way, um, but it's been fun and you know, it's been fun. When you think of data here again, the, the, the most important you know, thing from data standpoint on top of all the artificial intelligence we, that we talked about was really, um, you know, the pricing models, how much should be priced? What's the risk of someone having this issue versus, you know, that issue? And we think, you know, um, you know, um, uh, something happening with your phone is probably an equal probability thing, but we have seen a lot more cases of, you know, water damage, for example, in summer, because folks are going to the beaches, they're going to the uh, swimming pools and they leave their phones in their pockets, et cetera. And so there is a lot more science behind it. And that's where all the data has been helping figuring out how, what should be the different propensities, different probabilities of things happening, uh, how much, uh, you know, is the, you know, our, the risk out there, um, things of that nature. I kind of walk you, you know, you through, but just look at the, you know, how, how the accuracy has, has improved, right, in the last two years. Um, we were, you know, we, we were, at a much higher rate when you look at the orange line, which is really the lab environment or the control environment. Uh, and then when we look at the, the blue line, which is really the real world example, the number went down significantly and how we have been working towards getting that back up in the higher 90s range, 99, 99% 90, range right now. Uh, some examples of even how, how we thought of, you know, showing the, the you know, the cracks back to the customer has also changed, right? We were here just showing them plain, just plain screen. And here now we are into the green screens for the reasons that I mentioned before, the Star Wars example that I gave you before and how we were tiling before, now we are showing just them, you know, like circles. So it's, it's been an evol evolution in the last two years, four or five stages that we went through. Um, and I know we are at the time here, so I'm gonna quickly summarize a couple of things and then take the last few questions. So as you think of data monetization, uh, I went through the definition you know, before, um, but it's very, very simple. What can you do with your data uh, that would you know, earn you extra revenue or reduce your cost? And that's essentially what it is. Uh, there are multiple ways of data monetization and no two companies are same. So you know, the part that I'm sure today might not be the same thing that would work for you. Uh, depending on who you are, it's gonna be a different path. But remember that none of this stuff is possible if you do not have a good solid data foundation. That's the most important thing that you, that you need to have in your data before you think of data monetization, data productization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then always start internally, right? Always start internally. Make sure you have a good disciplined approach to your productization. Start internally, make sure you get feedback from your internal users first before you, before you go out, uh, you know, in the, in the open world. Uh, and then uh, it's not a one-time exercise. It's a journey, it's not a destination. You cannot just have one meeting, think of all the cool ideas on data monetization and then just never you know, come back as a team. It's an ongoing process. Every day, everything that you do, you have to think, and you know, is there an opportunity for me to get any extra dollars for the company? And then last but not least, all the legal battles that I had around data ownership, make sure you address those. You have to have a good strategy around, you know, what do you want your customers to do with the data and what can they not do it? Make sure that there is no, you are not losing any competitive advantage there that you have in the marketplace. Uh, make sure that you are covering all the legal aspects. And, and with that, I think I'll stop here, take a couple of questions. Uh, if you have any further questions, I know we are at time here, please, please send me the, uh, you know, send me an email here. I have my email address mentioned right here. And, and if you want to try or look or you know read about any of our products, I've mentioned a couple of uh, couple of links to the websites as well. Excellent, um, thanks, uh, Chintan. We uh, we really only have uh, like in the last minute, maybe one last question. If you look at the uh, chat box, yes, uh, I see a few questions here. Yeah. yeah. So do you want to take uh, maybe the one about the the squ the skills? Like, what skills would you recommend that people start with? Like, you have yeah, to have a data scientist on the uh, on the team. What skills do you recommend to, to start? Um, that's, a, that's a tricky question. Um, one thing that I always tell, tell people is when you are in the data business, uh, you have to have a team that thinks of business first. Um, you know, we all love data, but we should never lose 
uh, side of what the goal is, uh, why you are building this Vera product. So, um, you know, I would love to have someone who has a good combination of, uh, you know, data skills along with a good business ambition. Um, it's very hard to find a good combination, you know, someone with a good combination of those two. So I would, I would really start there. Someone who understands their data, but has a very, very good solid business acumen around that. Um, business experience. Yeah. Yeah. Business uh, experience. Yep. Yeah. So what, what, what we'd like to do is, uh, Chinton, we're, we're out of time here, uh, you know, 11, 15, we got to prepare for our next session. So on behalf of the symposium, uh, thank you for, uh, giving your time today. I know that we've received lots of feedback on our presentations of presenters and the uh, content that provided. So uh, we greatly thank you for your time and we hope to see you attend uh, future symposiums and, uh, you know, uh, hope to see you live from Boston next year. Well, we'd love to do that, Rob. Thank you so much. Stay safe uh, uh, and talk to you later. Same to you, Chinton. Stay safe. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.